Ladies and gentlemen, hi, welcome to lawcaseuk.com. Today, at the request of one of our subscribers, Dinah B, I'm going to be analysing the year 2000 Court of Appeal decision in the case of A, brackets, children, close brackets, open brackets, conjoined twins, surgical separation, close brackets. Now, as you can see from the detailed case title, the case involved the surgical separation of conjoined twins. Now, sadly, it was known in advance that if that procedure was to take place, it was bound to result in the death of one of the two children. And consequently, the case raised many complex questions of medical law, family law, criminal law, and of course, human rights law. But it was really the criminal aspect that caused the appeal judges the most difficulty and I will devote most of my time to that. And in this regard, you will see a link between this case of A and two cases that I've previously analysed on the website. That is the shipwreck case of Dudley and Stevens and also the case of Crown against Woolen, which deals with indirect oblique intention in terms of mens rea. But back to A, if I begin with the factual background, of course, now the two conjoined twins were both girls and in the case had pseudonyms Jodie and Mary. Um, they were joined at the lower abdomen and it was surgically possible to separate them but it was known, as I said, that the operation would kill one of the twins and in this case it was the weaker twin um, known as Mary. However, without the operation taking place, both twins would die, probably within months. Um, so the choice that existed was whether to save the stronger twin, Jody, at Mary's expense, or let them both die. There was not an outcome in which they both lived, sadly. Now, for religious reasons, the parents felt unable to consent to the operation. And although one of the most famous quotes that comes out of the case comes from Lord Justice Ward, where he says, this is a court of law, not of morals. The court did allow both the Archbishop of Westminster and the Pro-Life Alliance to make written submissions to the court. And so despite what Lord Justice Ward says about it being a court of law, and of course that's the basis upon which the decisions are reached, but despite that, you will find moral considerations throughout the judgment. But if we go back to looking at it as a legal action, um, of course, in the absence of parental consent, um, the doctors felt that they had no sanction authority for carrying out the operation. So therefore, they sought a declaration from the court that the operation may be lawfully carried out. And at first instance, they were granted that declaration. Um, and so in the current case we're looking at, we're concerned with the appeal by the parents to the Court of Appeal against that declaration that was given at the first instance. Now, moving from the facts to the law, I'm going to break this down into the compartments of law as the judges did into the case. I'm going to rely primarily on the judgment of Lord Justice Ward in relation to the family law aspect and then provide a separate explanation for each of the three um, judges in relation to the criminal law aspect and as well as Lord Justice Ward, the other two judges um, in the case are Lord Justices Brooke and Robert Walker. So let me start by looking at the medical aspect. And here we have Lord Justice Ward dealing initially with a question that is often asked. And for those of you who are familiar with the Charlie Gard case more recently, it was a question that had to be answered in that case and is often um, one that ha has to be answered, particularly for members of the public looking in on such a case. And the question is, what does this have to do with the courts at all? Shouldn't the parents decide what is best for their children? Now, we start from a position where the law recognises that in general a doctor is not entitled to treat a patient without the consent of someone who's authorised to give that consent. Um, for children, of course, that comes from the parents. And here Ward identifies that there is an important safeguard 
to ensure that a child um, receives proper treatment, and that is that these parental rights must be exercised in the best interests of the child. And in fact, he quotes Lord Scarman in the case of Gillick, and he says, the common law has never treated such rights, and here he means parental rights, as sovereign or beyond review and control. And then Lord Justice Ward continues by saying um, that overall the control is vested in the court. Um, so that's why if a case is brought to the court, it, the court has to decide, but taking into account the wishes of the, the children. Now, the court's prerogative to look after children forms part of the inherent jurisdiction that rests in the, or resides in the High Court. And also we see now that the Children Act of 1989 provides a statutory scheme for the resolution of disputes affecting the upbringing of children. So if anyone with a recognisable interest brings such a dispute to the court, it is the court that must decide it. The parents' wishes are of course relevant and deserving of respect, but ultimately the court has to make the decision. Now, because the statutory scheme exists within the Children Act, that takes us from the, the medical law question into the area of family law, which is the next area that um, Justice Ward explored. Now, under the 1989 Act, it is clear that the paramount consideration for the court is the welfare of the child. Um, and you will find if you read the judgment that um, the judges in the case regard this consideration of, of welfare as synonymous with, quote, best interests of the child, and they use the phrases interchangeably. interchangeably. Now, if we look at the two children, um, in Jodie's case, of course, there was ample evidence that it was in her interests for the operation to be performed. It was her only chance of survival. But for Mary, that wasn't the case. And here, Lord Justice Ward concluded that the operation was not actually in her interests, as it would bring her life to an end before it had run its natural speed span, even though that span was going to be very short in any event. So here, Ward arrives at what he describes as the horns of a dilemma. The best interests were obvious if they're viewed separately. Best interests operate for Jody. best interests don't operate for Mary. But how could he resolve the conflicting interests in the case? Now, he could find no direct authority on the point. Um, but he does find some guidance in the Court of Bill decision of Birmingham um, City Council um, and H, brackets a minor, 1993. And having looked at the authorities, and in particular that case, he decided that, obviously, if he treats every child's interest as paramount, he could not find in favour of, of Jody because Mary's competing interest would um, prevent that outcome. But also, if at the same time he decided to do nothing, that would be a total abdication of the duty that the courts have, which I've already identified in the earlier section. So given that conflict of duty, he decided that the only way to address the dilemma was to choose, quote, the lesser of the two evils, and so finding the least detrimental alternative. Now clearly adopting that reasoning, that would allow the operation to go ahead, it would allow Jody to be saved, um, and that was his decision on the family law aspect. And in this regard, Lord Justice Brooke agreed with Ward's analysis. Um, the third judge, Robert Barker, however, differed from the majority view in this regard he reached a conclusion that the operation was actually in the interests of both children, including Mary, and he did this on the basis that prolonged life actually held no benefit for her. So he saw no dilemma in this aspect. So he sanctioned the operation, but on the basis that there, there wasn't a choice of interest, it was in the interests of both children that the operation should proceed. 
Now, if I go back to Lord Justice Ward and the question of the parents' objections, he stated the court that, again, the court had to respect and consider those views, but he reiterated that once the matter had been referred to it, it had to make the decision. It was not in the business of reviewing the reasonableness of the parents' view, but what the court had to do was to make its own view, reach its own view on the facts that were presented to it and the law as it found it to be. Um, and in this regard, all three of the judges, in terms of the family law, decided that the operation should, be, should proceed on a best interest basis. Now, having decided this, then the court had to ask the question of whether such an operation would be unlawful in the sense that it could amount to the murder of Mary. And this is why it takes us into the realm of the criminal law. Um, and it's here where the judges diverge most obviously in their opinion, so this is why I'm going to take them um, each in turn. So, in addressing the criminal law aspect, I start with Lord Justice Ward. Um, he sets out, of course, the elements of the crime of murder, and he alights on this issue of mens rea as being the crucial one here. Um, and of course, as you will know, the important mens rea for murder is intention. Now, as the surgeons had no direct intention to kill Mary, they didn't, that wasn't their purpose, they didn't wish to do that. But what the important question then became, of course, one of indirect intention, oblique intention. Um, and this is where the case of Woolen comes in. And here Ward identified that based upon that test, sorry, based upon that case, the test to be applied was whether the doctors recognised that death or serious harm would be virtually certain to result from carrying out this operation. Clearly they did have this foresight, um, and because of this the mens rea for murder, murder was present, alongside with um, all of the other elements of that particular crime, with the exception of the requirement that the killing be unlawful. Um, so, one way in which a, a killing could be lawful, of course, is if there was a defence to, the, um, to the allegation of murder. And here, um, in, in finding that the killing would be lawful, Lord Justice Ward employed what he called a plea of quasi-self-defence. In effect, the doctors were coming to Jody's defence, and they were removing the threat of fatal harm that was presented to her by Mary's, quote, draining of her lifeblood. Um, and so because they were coming to the defence of Jodie, that enabled the, um, a plea of self-defence to be made and made the intervention by the doctors a lawful one. Um, because quite simply he was suggesting that without intervention, Mary would kill Jodie. Now, the next judge to offer an opinion was Lord Justice Brooke, and um, he went into the greatest detail on the criminal aspect of the case. Um, like Ward, he concluded that the doctors would possess the requisite mens rea, that is, intention in a woolen sense. But he went on to decide that also that the operation would not be unlawful, but this time due to the availability of an alternative defence, that of necessity. And in this case, he endorsed the three requirements for necessity, um, which were set out by Sir James Stephen. Um, firstly, here we go, that the act is needed to avoid inevitable and irreparable evil, that no more should be done than is reasonably necessary for the purpose to be achieved, and that the evil inflicted must not be proportionate to the evil to be avoided. Now, the word evil there is probably a little bit outdated, but you can see um, where Sir James Stephen was coming from. Um, and what Lord Justice Brooke decided was, given that the principles of family law had pointed irresistibly to the conclusion that the interests of Jody must be preferred to the conflicting interests of Mary, he considers that all three of the requirements set out were satisfied, that it was necessary for this to take place, and therefore that is the defence that was available. 
Now, <coughs> you might think that the shipwreck case of Dudley and Stevens was against him on this point. But he managed to distinguish Dudley and Stevens on the basis that the policy reasons behind Dudley and Stevens did not apply in the present case. So, for example, the first policy objection in Dudley um, is evident from the questions that are asked by the court in the case. And there they say, for example, who is to be the judge of this sort of necessity? By what measure is the comparative value of lives to be measured? Um, but here, uh, Lord Justice Brooke thought that did not apply. This wasn't a case of um, lay people in a lifeboat deciding who, who dies, who gets eaten, etc. Here, um, we had a situation in which doctors had themselves identified that Mary was already designated for an, alter, uh, for an early death. That was going to happen in, in any event. Um, he also looked at the second objection from Dudley St and Stevenson, which was... Um, to permit that, that type of defence would mark a, um, a divorce of law from morality. But here he said that um, this court's not really equipped to choose between competing moral philosophies. All that the court can do is say that it's not at all obvious that this is the sort of clear cut case where you would divorce law from mora morality. Um, so the concerns that the judges had in Dudley and Stevenson, um, Lord Justice Brooke felt, were not present in this case. Um, so he found that the operation was justified on the grounds of necessity and therefore the corresponding defence was available to the surgeons who performed it. Um, that may sound a little bit vague on the reasons that I'm putting forward, um, but suffice to say he recognised that Dudley and Stevens was potentially a roadblock to this um, un, um, path that he was going down, and he distinguished the case um, on the basis that the, the policy objections that one can read into um, Dudley and Stevenson were, were not present in the current case, and that was his view. Now, the last judge to give his an opinion was um, Lord Justice Robert Walker. Um, to be honest, I find this the hardest judgment to fathom, um, and you can see why, really, because you, um, he bases it, for example, on... Let's see if I can find it on quite a wide, widely cast speech of Sir Thomas Bingham in um, when he was Masters of the Rolls um, in a Court of Appeal decision, whose judgment was late, then approved by the House of Lords, in particular by Lord Gough, in the 1993 case of Airedale NHS Trusts and Bland, and this is a really important case on. Um, the role of medics and the ending of life and in, involves a teenager um, who is then allowed to die, a teenager who be, um, was injured during the Hillsborough incident and then um, was allowed to, allowed to die. And this case addresses um, the law behind that, the facts in that particular case. But here we have Robert Walker identifying the following quote from um, Thomas Bingham, where he said, for present purposes, I do not think it greatly matters whether one simply says that, that it is not an unlawful act, or that a doctor lacks criminal intent, or that he breaches no duty, or that his act did not cause death. So, Lord Bingham thinks that that doesn't matter, and so Lord Justice Robert Walker then makes a similar, albeit not identical, statement in his conclusion when he says, the proposed operation would not be unlawful. Well, that's clear. It would involve the positive act of invasive surgery and Mary's death would be foreseen as an inevitable consequence of an operation which is intended and is necessary, and I pause at the word necessary, to save Jodie's life. But Mary's death would not be the purpose or intention of the surgery and she would die because tragically her body on its own is not and has never been viable. So despite the fact that Mary's death is foreseeable, in fact foreseen as inevitable, um, and therefore satisfying the willing um, test for indirect intention, he concludes that it would not be the intention of the sur surgeons. Um, 
and, and that's where I have a little bit of difficulty following the, the reasoning there. Um, obviously, it's not their purpose, and that takes care of direct intention, but um, it does seem to satisfy indirect intention. But we may be able to make sense of his judgment if we go back to that word that I highlighted when he said, um, it is an inevitable consequence of an operation which is intended and necessary to save Jody's life. So here, we see that word necessary, and he then says, in the absence of parliamentary intervention, the law as to the defence of necessity is going to have to develop on a case-by-case -case basis. I would extend it, if it needs to be extended, to cover this case. So, like Brooke, I think we can see support for a defence of necessity in the judgment of Robert Walker. It's set out differently and it's not as obvious, um, but ultimately, how we get around the woolen indirect intention problem, I think the same conclusion arises, I, the judge hands the surgeons a defence and in Ward's case it's based on self-defence, but in the case of Brooke and um, Robert Walker, they both alight upon um, a defence of necessity. So let me offer you a few things to wrap up the case. Um, now, the reason for the differing views on the legal aspects is best explained by the fact that all three judges thought the facts that they were presented with were unique, unprecedented, so they were breaking new ground, at least in applying existing law to new facts. So that explains um, <coughs> the difference in reasoning, etc. Um, if we look at the, what's going on mechanically, returning the, to the outcome of the appeal, the outcome is crystal clear. Um, all judges agreed that the operation should proceed on family law grounds, and also that if it were to proceed, the actions of the surgeons would not be unlawful under the criminal law. So in that respect, the outcome is crystal clear. The courts did consider, or the court considered, the Human Rights Act because it was due to enter into force within days of this taking place. And any operation that took place would take place after the act had come into effect. Um, and whilst all the judges did consider the ECHR, and in particular the right to life under Article 2, none of them thought that the introduction of the Human Rights Act would lead to a different decision in the case, so they were able to park that quite conveniently. Um, the other thing that um, the court was keen to add was, um, it was keen to point out that this decision could not become authority for wider propositions, such as a doctor, once he or she has identified that a patient cannot survive, can kill that patient by way of euthanasia. So they closed down any suggestion that their reasoning could be used in such a case. And so finally, that just leaves me with a bit of a postscript. Now, as was anticipated, Mary sadly died during the operation. Um, but for Jody, the separation did mean that she met the expectation of a normal life that had been hoped for in the hearing. Now, I last heard of Jodie when she was 14 in a newspaper article that reported her as alive and well and harbouring ambitions to be a doctor. So in that respect, the um, operation was a success. Um, as for Lord Justice Ward, well, he became the inspiration for <coughs> Ian McEwan's 2014 novel, um, The Children Act, and a novel which um, there features a judge who's affected by a ruling she has to give in a case involving the separation of conjoined twins. So you can see the similarity. Um, it's a book that's later made into a film starring Emma Thompson as the judge. So there you have it. That's the case. Rather sad, rather tragic case, but legally quite important. Firstly, for the medical and family reasoning, but in particular for the criminal aspects in, um, explored by the three judges in the case. Thank you.